Ladies and gentlemen, namaskar. Welcome to the 15th edition of the Jaipur Literature Festival, protected by the tall Banega Swast India at Front Lawn. The festival brochure and flyer with details of the full program are available for purchase at the information desk. We are delighted to announce the Mount Bettons. The session is presented by Morning Standard. Andrew Loney's The Mount Bettons, The Lives and Loves of Dickie and Edwina, Mount Betton is an intimate story of an unusual marriage in a family of great intrigue. Loney illustrates the powerful partnership of the last Viceroy of India, Dickie, and the magnetic, wealthy, and universally loved Edwina, comprised of exceptional power, influence, glamour, manipulation, disaster, and most specifically, instrumental to the making of the 20th century. Loney has most recently petitioned the British government to release the Mountbatten documents and explores in his books the questions they might definitely answer, revealing the truth behind Dipe Raid, the partition of India, the affair between Edwina and Nehru, and the assassination of Mountbatten in 1979. In conversation with Narayani Basu, Loney reveals the truth behind and is a fellow of the Royal Historical Society. He later returned to Cambridge as a visiting fellow at Churchill College. His published books include the biographies of writer John Buchan, Spy Guy, Burgess, and Edward VIII. Narayani Basu is the best-selling author of V.P. Menon, The Unsung Architect of Modern India. A historian and foreign policy analyst, Basu's current area of interest focuses on highlighting the lesser known but key players behind the story of Indian independence. She continues to write extensively on foreign policy for several acclaimed international publications. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Andrew Loney in conversation with Narayani Basu. Thank you. So lovely to see all of you here and it's even lovelier to be in conversation with Andrew Loney today. Uh, the Mount Patterns have been a hot topic of conversation in any social conversation, even today. Um, you know, we think when you think about the Mount Battens, you automatically think about the transfer of power in India because that is, in this country, the best thing that they're associated with. Um, but in presenting this biography, uh, Andrew's not only done hundreds of interviews, not only accessed archives, but filed hundreds of freedom of information requests uh, to sort of provide a holistic picture of the Mount Patterns. Now, let's talk about that first. Um, why did you feel that it was important to file these requests? What did you feel would result from it? What kind of picture did you feel would emerge of Mount Patterns? Well, I think the problem we have in Britain, as you have in India, is many of the files are retained by government, uh, and the only way to access them is through freedom of information requests. Now, it's very difficult to, to, to obtain this material. Uh, a lot of our documents are even destroyed, about 80% of them, without any record being kept. So I had two campaigns. One was to get these diaries and letters of the couple released, which had been bought by public funds to be seen by the public. Uh, and the other was to file these FOI requests uh, to see what could be released. Um, and in some respects, I was successful, ironically, more successful in the States than I was here. And in the States, I was able to, to for example, get the FBI file that was kept on both of them. But it, it is a real problem for historians that material which there's no reason for it to be kept back, it's, it's, it doesn't fulfill any of the exemption criteria, uh, is, is not being released. Uh, and I've set up something called uh, Historians for Freedom of Information. To, uh, for historians to gather together and to lobby for these documents to be released. Because you can't really, documents are the, are the, the building bricks of the past for historians. You Excuse can't me. tell the story of what happened in the past without access to them. And so what we have is governments or individuals censoring the past, uh, creating their own story, which is not the truth. Then let's talk about Dickie and Edwina individually before we come to you know, when they marry in 1922. Um, 
what were their childhood form formative years like? Did they live very different lives? At Mountbatten seemed to have lived a very traditional English aristocratic uh, life. Edwina had a very rootless kind of youth with very uh, physically and emotionally absent parents. Tell us more about that. Yes, I mean, uh, Dickie was the last great uh, grandchild of Queen Victoria and her last uh, godchild. Uh, so he had that connection with the royal family really from his birth and was closely associated with, with four generations of the royal family right through to Prince Charles. He actually came from a very tight-knit family, but he was the youngest child. He was spoiled. He came much later. Uh, and I think that, um, in a sense, affected his character. He, he, in a sense, had no boundaries set for him, and he was able to do what he wanted. But he had love and support. Uh, poor Edwina, who again was well connected, her godfather was Edward VII, and she was named after him, and came from a very ri rich background. But her mother died when she was very young. She had a stepmother who really wasn't very interested in her. And so she had, as you say, a very emotionally deprived background. And I think uh, this may explain why later in life she was a very compassionate person. She was, in a sense, I think, wanted to make up for that loveless childhood by bringing love and compassion to, particularly to children. But I think it also explains the early part of her life when she was very promiscuous and searching for love with men. Uh, and in some ways, the book is a game of two halves in which Edwina is, is, is in a sense, the villain of the first half and the heroine of the second. And Dickie, it's the other way around. Dickie yeah. is the hero and the very um, sensitive and vulnerable cuckolded husband in the first half and then they're all the pompous, arrogant man of the second half. So it's a very interesting dynamic, the marriage. When they met uh, first in 1920, uh, 22, sorry, uh, was it sort of instant chemistry between them? What, what They were thrown together constantly. What brought them together to look at? Well, they met uh, at a, a sailing regatta in Cowes, in, 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 in fact, in 1921. Um, but actually, their romance was played out here in India because she, it was instant attraction. I mean, I think there were, the fact that she was wealthy was part of the attraction for him. And I think she felt, she, they were both looking for security. They were both very young, but she was determined in some ways to escape her family. Uh, and she followed him out. He was on a tour with the um, Prince of Wales, the future King Edward VIII. And she went and actually uh, he proposed to her in the Viceroy's house in New Delhi. So they traveled around India together. And this was one of the reasons why when they came, were sent to India in 47, that they sort of knew the country and loved the country. And you sort of see a sort of dissonance emerging right off the bat, right? You, you see uh, Dickie very much in love with Edwina at this point. Um, you see Edwina, as you say, I mean, she'd led a childhood and a life that was so closely controlled that she somehow thought marriage was going to be a, a sort of an escape route to freedom. I mean, and then it wasn't. It turned out to be something uh, completely else for both of them. It, I think it was very difficult for her because she, she exchanged one, one prison for another. He was away uh, with his naval service a lot of the time. She was on her own. Uh, there was no role. She was a highly intelligent woman who wanted to do something, and there was no role for her. So she went shopping and went out for dinner with her friends and quite quickly began to have affairs. And I think one of the fascinating things is now that 99% of these diaries and letters have been released, that actually it's very clear that Dickie was desperately in love with her all the way through his life. Um, and in some ways, she loved him. It's, it's, it's an unusual marriage because she had her affairs, and he did too. But um, it was a much more loving relationship than actually most marriages are. I think, I mean, it, it's a very complex picture that you've drawn in this biography. I think, uh, you know, when, when you're looking at the early days of their marriage, you see these letters that you've quoted where he's writing to her saying, you know, I wish that I could love you the way that, you know, you seem to want me to do. Um, and she, he was very much aware that he seemed to bore her at a certain level. Um, and he seemed to be very upset by that. It seemed to hurt him deeply in the early days of their marriage. Yes, I mean, the public image of Mountbatten, he's always dressed in uniforms. He looks splendid. It's one of the reasons he was chosen to be viceroy. He, he played a part and needed almost to dress up in these uniforms to do that. But underneath, he was a very insecure, um, rather gauche young man, had very little experience of the other sex. Um, and 
he wasn't really part of the British establishment. He was really German. Uh, his, the, the family name had been Battenberg. It had been changed by his father in, during the First World War. And so his sensibilities were not those of a British public schoolboy, but actually of a German, which is why he, 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 didn't, he, he was a, not a gentleman player. He was a sort of player. Um, but I think one of the things that is rather touching about him is, is this insecurity and this, he, he couldn't do anything right. And even when they were in India, I think one of the factors that we forget about uh, independence and partition is that Mountbatten was not just wrestling with the political problems, but he was wrestling with a wife who had wanted to divorce him before they came out, who was going through the menopause, who was throwing saucepans at him late at night. Uh, and um, he was distracted by these sort of personal elements in his life, uh, as well as the challenges of what he had to do. So it's a very human story um, in, against the backdrop of, of, of big, important events. I think it's interesting also somehow that you've titled this chapter Duty, the one on their courtship and marriage. I mean, as a historian sort of looking back, did you feel like it was sort of a box that they had to take because of their age, where they were in life? Uh, because you seem to somehow get the sense that, you know, this was ultimately what they had to do. And then they discovered, apart from their affection for each other, that their lives seem to be taking them in completely different directions because it's a, it's a very volatile marriage that emerges as the years progress. Uh, you, have, uh, se you have a confrontation also between uh, Dickie and Edwina at one point uh, where Edwina's completely not expecting Dickie to confront her the way he does. And for him also it's revelatory because he writes to her saying that he's suddenly not as scared of her as he used to be. So I think that would have been some kind of a turning point for him also because he had so much to prove for himself on the professional front as well. Yes, I mean, he put up with her infidelities um, as long as he, she didn't affect his career in the Navy, which in some ways was more important to him. He was determined to become first sea lord like his father had been and, and also not to affect his relationship with the royal family. So the marriage had to fit into those two sort of criteria. Um, and they did come to an accommodation. There is a, 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 an extraordinary moment where, as you say, he challenges her. He gets the strength to, to confront her with her affairs, um, one of which was with one member of one of his polo teams, the, one of the first important ones. And um, they agreed to, to split to part. And then she comes, makes excuse. They'd always had separate bedrooms. She makes excuse to come to him in the night to return a book. And she uses this as an opportunity to, to apologize. And they make up and they agree to have this open marriage as long as she is discreet about it. Uh, and that's how they continue. So it's all turns on that one, that literally one evening. Um, and she continues to have her affairs. Um, and then he begins to have an affair, but um, it's never a fair, it never, he puts up, he's very, he's not a jealous person. He puts up with these people. Uh, and in fact, he allows Nehru, when she dies, to send a frigate and, and pay his respects at her funeral. Um, but whenever he wanted to bring someone home, she was always uh, peeking through, the, through the, the keyhole to see what was going on. And she had this trick when, when he arranged to go off with them of arranging to go off with, with the, the girlfriend herself. So he'd come back from leave thinking he was going off to Paris and find she wasn't there. She was with his wife. And you see also his career as it's beginning to take off. In 1931, he becomes a you know, fleet wireless officer. And it's, it's set against a difficult economic backdrop as well. There's, an, there's a booming sterling crisis. There are mutinies on board the Atlantic fleet because of pay cuts. Uh, there seems to have been a claim that he made of quashing a mutiny on board the Mediterranean fleet where he was. Uh, what was his career like at this point? Because he was still climbing the rungs to... Yeah, he was always seen as, uh, as someone who would go to the top. I mean, he was one of the few signal officers in the, in the Navy. I mean, he, he made that a specialism when most people didn't. Uh, and he, he was ahead of his, his, his generation, his cohort for um, promotion. One has to be careful about Mountbatten because he tells his own version of events, which is not necessarily the truth. Yeah. But I think it is right that he, he probably did interfere with or, or stop the mutiny uh, in, in 1931. Right. Uh, and uh, I'm giving a talk next week on him and intelligence. Now, it's very difficult to find any information because intelligence files, of course, are always closed. Mm -hmm. But I think it's very clear that he had a very strong intelligence um, component to his job, uh, 
partly through signals, all the way through. And that was another factor which made him attractive when they, he was given staff jobs during the Second World War. And at this point, as you as you said, you know, since they'd had this confrontation, uh, Edwina seems to have been, uh, you know, suddenly bored by her lovers because she wasn't getting quite the reaction from Dickie as she was used to. But then comes this affair with Paul Robeson. Um, and it, it had such a great impact, I think, on both of them. Um, because Paul Robeson was essentially, uh, I mean, he was a black man, essentially. Um, and she was made to testify in court that she didn't know who he was. How did this, tell us more about this and how that affected their marriage, how that possibly affected her views of the palace, because the, I think the palace did intervene there a bit. Uh, what happened in the fallout of that? Did it? Well, they were both attracted to dark-skinned uh, people. Uh, and in fact, the important affair wasn't so much with Paul Robeson, the actor. It was with a singer called Leslie, Leslie Hutchinson. Hutchinson. But as you say, Robeson was, was the name that came up. And I think at this point, the royal family uh, felt that she was bringing them into disrepute. Uh, and she was basically sent into exile. And for the next four or five years, she just traveled the world. She didn't really see her children. Young, young, she had young children who were in their, at that stage only three or four. Um, so she wasn't at all a good mother. Um, but uh, sometimes she left them in a hotel and forgot about them for six months until the nanny would say, by the way, it's, we need some winter clothes here. But th there was this point where she turned very anti-establishment. And I think that was part of the attraction with someone like Nehru. She was investigated by the FBI for her pro-communist views. Um, and she liked all the pomp and circumstance. She wanted all the benefits of being linked to the royal family without any of the responsibilities or duties. Mm. But that's not uncommon. And... In 1934, Dickie achieves his first command, and this is where you're beginning to see flashes of his public character, the, the kind and the paradoxical character that he also had. He was extremely technically inventive and innovative. He was very micromanaging. Um, he was somebody who was quite a showman, also. So you have you have this sort of public image also emerging because along with that is also this very playboy image um, and he, he tells one of his friends that you know I mean when people look at me it's so easy to sort of dismiss me as a playboy with the fast life the celebrity friends the, the fast cars nobody will actually believe that I'm actually working so I mean do you feel like there was uh, there were huge sort of achievements that he attained as he progressed? Uh, absolutely. I think this is one of the paradoxes that he's still seen even in, I think, in India as this playboy figure. Uh, and Edwina's wealth, she was the richest heiress in the world when they married, allowed him to indulge all his loves. They had a yacht, they had polo ponies, uh, and he worked hard, played hard. And I think people only saw the, the, the playing bit. But he was able, for example, it helped his career, he was able to have huge dinner parties entertaining influential uh, naval commanders, politicians, which of course helped him with his career. But he worked very hard. He was um, often used to train other officers on signals. And everyone has good reports of him. Uh, and, but the problem is that's overshadowed by the fact that they were in the newspapers every day, going to nightclubs and, and, and going to the south of France. So it's, uh, I think his, his career was perceived to be less successful than it actually was. But it really, the big change came in the Second World War with his Churchill, who became his great mentor. And Churchill had this um, guilt complex about him because it was Churchill who had sacked his father as first chief lord, yeah. first, uh, first sea lord. Uh, and so he felt he had some obligations to the son. Um, and in some ways, that playboy image was quite useful for the jobs that Churchill gave him because he, he looked like a film star. He, in fact, mixed with film stars. The honeymoon was spent with Charlie Chaplin. So it, 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 Churchill was able to make use, uh, I suppose, of that, that, that um, playboy image. Um, and he had great charm and, was, and got on very well with other nationalities, particularly the, the Americans. So he, he was actually, uh, that was a very good appointment when he was moved to, to chief of combined operations. Um, we, we will get to that in a minute, but this is also the point when both of them meet uh, two of their great loves. Mountbatten meets Yola Letelier, 
uh, Edwina meets uh, Bunny Phillips, and that becomes one of her great loves. Uh, tell us more about both of these characters. Well, Yola Letelier was married to a much older French um, businessman and proprietor called Henri Letelier. And um, this relationship from Mountbatten lasted until his death. Uh, it became a much more platonic relationship in time. But uh, she was um, very much part of his life. He would go across and see her in Paris on a regular basis. And Bunny Phillips, as you say, was the great love of Edwina's life before Nehru. Uh, in fact, uh, Dickie had agreed that they should divorce so she could marry Bunny. Uh, and then Bunny met, introduced by Edwina, Edwina's best friend, uh, uh, Gina Phillips, and married her. And Edwina was so upset, she the, the family thought would commit suicide. They accompanied her everywhere, worried that she would throw herself into the lake in their country house. So, um, but one of the fascinating things is that Bunny Phillips was, became, remained a friend of Mountbatten. He actually served on his staff in Southeast Asia. Uh, and they themselves shared a lover, a woman called Janie Lindsay. One of the complications of this book is everyone is sleeping with everyone else, <laughs> um, including each other's partners. <laughs> So it gets you, when you do the Venn diagrams, they cross <laughs> each other the whole time. Yeah. And I, I mean, by this point, this is a word that's sort of racing towards war also. This, so this is a very public marriage set against a deepening global crisis. Um, and you write about how war was eventually to be the making of both of them. Um, when... By 1936 also, there is something else that is happening, which is the abdication crisis. What did both of them feel individually about David and Wallace? What were their stands on the huge crisis that there was in Britain at that point? Well, it placed Dick in a difficult position because he had been, uh, the Prince of Wales had been his best man when he got married in 1922. He'd been his ADC on his world travels, including to India in 22. Uh, and they remained very friendly. Uh, and of course, he thought when he became king, he would be given this extraordinary position of, of, of influence. Uh, so the abdication was a surprise to them. But Dickey was very good at uh, riding two horses and a necessary jumping horse when he needed to. So within weeks, he had basically transferred his affections to George VI. Uh, and uh, Edward VIII never really, well, he did eventually forgive him um, because he had expected him to be his best man. But Dickey was a very astute uh, figure who realized that you know, he needed to keep in with the new royal family. And it was a very bitter occasion, the abdication of, in terms of the family relations. So um, it was only much later in life that the two were reconciled. Dickey never liked Wallace Simpson, and he would only go and see um, the Duke of Windsor, he then was in Paris, when Wallace was away, generally getting one of her regular facelifts. Um, so... Um, it, 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 he, he managed to keep in eventually with them. And of course, the Duke had very little power after 1936, so it didn't really matter. Mm. Edwina, it, I don't think she had a very strong feeling about it, um, but they were very close to, 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 to the whole matter. One of the great champions, apart from Churchill, of uh, Edward VIII was Beaverbrook, who had been one of Edwina's lovers, just as Edwina's mistress, Jean Norton, had been one of um, Dickie's lovers. So they were very much part of that scene. And this is also a point when Mountbatten's been given command of the HMS Kelly. Now that also was a slightly checkered career on board the HMS Kelly, uh, where he showed a sort of almost deliberate disregard of a more seasoned, uh, you know, a, a seaman on what caused plot for Norway, for example. Um, and it Ordinarily, it ended, in, it, in, it ended in disaster there, but it, ordinarily, it would have led to a court-martial. Why did it not in the case of Dickey? Well, it's a good question, because of his good connections, having <laughs> invited all these senior naval officers to, to lunch. <laughs> yeah. um, you're absolutely right. He ignored instructions from senior officers. The result was that, um, uh, the, 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 I think, 400 men were captured. Uh, and spent the war in captivity because he didn't rescue the ship he should have done. He was um, torpedoed. He, the boat was mined. So this, Kelly was a new destroyer that actually spent a, a, only a matter of weeks at sea. Most of the time it was in dry dock being, being fixed. 
And you're absolutely right. Well, on one occasion where it was torpedoed, 27 men died, and he should have been court-martialed. That's what the Admiralty wanted. But he, um, he was a great showman, and he, he, ex he brought the ship back with a very limited crew back to Britain. It captured the news headlines at a time in the war when things were going badly. They needed some sort of feel-good factor. Uh, and so he became a hero. So instead of actually um, being court-martialed, Edwina, who was often deployed on his behalf, uh, lobbied for uh, a, a DSO, um, Distinguished Service Order. And so he was rewarded for this rather than actually being punished. And that happened all the way through his life. Um, things where he should have been in trouble, he managed to turn around and, and, and help himself up the, up the greasy pole. I mean, we come straight from there to the Dieppe raid. Uh, because in 1940, he assumes command of combined operations. He is one of the voices who, which is advocating for landings in Normandy, not the only voice, as he would later claim. Uh, what happened with the Dia Parade? Why, why did it completely go wrong? And in some ways, did his PR machinery not actually go into overtime here to actually give him uh, a good face post that? Yes, which uh, Mountbatten always had, he was probably the first of the sort of big public figures to employ PR specialists to spin for him. Uh, and he certainly did that with Dieppe. The appointment to combined operations, which was to mount raids on occupied Europe to harry the enemy, was a good one. And he loved these sort of um, operations, which in a sense were high profile and um, where he could work outside conventional military strategies. And many of them were successful. The problem with Dieppe uh, in 1942 was that it was a very misconceived plan with too many cooks. Uh, and um, this was a, uh, they had, it didn't really have a strict objective. Partly, he claimed later it was to, to, to is a test run for, for D Day and the landings to probe the enemy offenses to see what the problems might be. But, um, and it's now emerged that there was also an attempt to capture one of the Enigma cipher machines that they needed to, um, in order to, to break the codes. But the fact is that there, were, uh, th there was no obvious change of command, a uh, chain of command. The, the um, uh, support from the Navy and from the Air Force to, to, to give cover for the raid was withdrawn. Uh, inexperienced Canadian troops were used for political reasons. Uh, the intelligence which was produced by a friend of his was poor. Um, people didn't get to the right place at the right time. The tanks which landed on the beach uh, couldn't actually get through the, the gravel. Uh, and so it was a disaster. Almost a thousand Canadian troops were killed, captured or wounded. Uh, and, but he was very good at deflecting the blame. The, the poor Canadian commander was sent to run a training depot. Uh, and meanwhile, Mountbatten went on to even greater things. Uh Extremely, very much greater things. Uh, he then becomes um, Supreme Allied Commander of Southeast Asia. Um, and how is the war, how was the war bringing, did it bring them together? What, what was their marriage like at this point? Because you're also looking at eventually the war di di dialing down and eventually getting over. Uh, what kind of post-war life were they looking at? Because this was a period of immense high pressure. Uh, you say pressure brought them together. They worked well together under pressure. Yeah, you're absolutely right when you say that war was the making of both of them. And I think particularly Edwina, she suddenly had a purpose in life. She was brought in to run the St. John Ambulance in Britain, was a very effective organizer. She learned a lot from Dickie. He grew to respect her as an equal. Uh, and... Um, I think that continued when he went to Southeast Asia. They actually worked apart. Uh, she remained in Britain when he was in Southeast Asia. Uh, and he, she had a, a various a series of lovers in Britain, and he had a series of lovers in, in um, first of all, based in Delhi and then in, in Sri Lanka. Um, but she had a role to play in reconstruction at the end of the war. Uh, and I think it was because of his work in Southeast Asia in, in, in recognizing the new the importance of the nationalism, the fact that states which had perhaps not been sympathetic to the British should be given their independence. And so he was ahead of his time in that respect. I think that was, again, another reason for his appointment in 47 to come as the last viceroy. Was it something that he was reluctant to do or something that he was interested in taking up, uh, he and Edwina both, uh, the position of viceroy of India? 
I think the two versions. One is that, uh, is what he claimed, he didn't want to come, he wanted to continue in the Navy. But I think he was flattered to be asked uh, and he felt his, du his duty to do so. And though they were apart and were due to split, I think Edwina felt she should support him. It was one of the reasons he'd been given the appointment. Uh, and she, she felt there was, you know, she, it would be a fascinating thing to do. So in some ways, that public appointment helped cement the marriage. And they came and they worked very well together. She took a particular interest in women and welfare when she came to India uh, and um, was very good at lobbying um, women in, 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 in connected with the politicians here. Um, which no one really had done before, realized that, that perhaps was, would be useful. So all the way through, we have this tension between the public and private partnership. It sort of comes together here, certainly in the public partnership. And in the private partnership, we had Nehru. So tell us more about Edwina and Nehru, which is, I think, what lots, lots of people yeah, are looking Yeah, well, it's fascinating. To. And of course, until we see the Nehru correspondence, which remains closed, um, uh, it'll be very difficult to know exactly what happened. But... The information I got, the story is that they were drawn to each other quite quickly. She had met him first in Singapore in 1946, uh, but there, and there was an instant attraction. But the, their relationship, which they now claim was, uh, the family claims was platonic, uh, only began after independence in 47. I think the reality is that there was this instant attraction uh, and there was um, probably a sexual relationship almost immediately from March 47. Mm. Um, but in some ways, that doesn't matter. It's, it's the influence she had. She was used as an intermediary between Mountbatten and Nehru. And of course, he was a very important player in terms of, of partition independence. Uh, and it meant that they were not totally impartial. I think they were unconsciously sympathetic, perhaps, to the Hindu uh, and the Congress, rather than to Jinnah, who they found very difficult to get on with. And I think that, of course, had political ramifications. So this is a good example where, for the historian, the private and the public come together. Um, we have five minutes, so I'm going to open the floor for questions. So on, in the second row, I think there's someone. Oh, third row, sorry. Is there any evidence uh, that Mountbatten tried to overthrow the British elected government? Uh, yes, there is some evidence. Uh, I have a whole chapter on it in my book. Uh, he, the one regret he had was that he, as a member of the royal family, couldn't become prime minister. He thought he was suitably, he, was, he would make a brilliant prime minister. Uh, and there were problems in the 1960s. Harold Wilson's government um, uh, had problems with the unions. The economy was in a mess. Uh, Mountbatten had always believed, he was a, he was a serviceman. He believed in, in discipline, strong government. Uh, and he was approached by a newspaper proprietor to get involved in a coup in 1968. Uh, now, the conventional view is that he said, no, go away, I'm not interested. But in fact, looking at the papers, and I've triangulated the correspondence between the different uh, participants in this, I have to say a lot of that material is missing for the relevant months and is either destroyed or retained. But it's very clear that he was flattered. He had a series of meetings. He, in fact, suggested people who could take part in the coup, uh, everyone ranging from civil servants and military leaders through to the head of a film company he was close to. Um, so I think that's absolutely uh, true. And I think wiser councils, the Queen said, you can't overthrow an elected government, which I'm head, and he realized that. Uh, but there, were, of course, were other attempts after that in the 1970s, which I think were much more serious, uh, which involved the British intelligence services. But Mountbatten wasn't involved in those. But it's a good example of how, again, he keeps changing the story. He was very good at briefing the press with his own version of events, uh, suing people who, in a sense, wanted to say something else, suppressing documents that might paint a different picture. I think William has a question. What do you think of the charge made by Andrew Roberts and others that uh, by speeding up partition, uh, Mount Batten hugely increased the bloodshed and was responsible ultimately for tens of thousands of deaths. Well, it's, it's a very interesting essay that Andrew Roberts writes, but I think he's wrong um, because I think he had no choice. I mean, there was huge communal violence even before Mountbatten came out. All the advice he was being given was that uh, there would be no, no India to give away unless he moved very quickly. And that was coming from his men, all sorts of other people as chief of staff. So I, I, I but I do think that um, there could have been better preparation. I mean, they were being warned 
uh, by uh, governors like Olive Carew and uh, Evan Jenkins, that there would be bloodshed. The problem was that the British wanted to, um, uh, in a sense, leave India on a high. They didn't want to, to be policing India with a civil war that they weren't involved in. They didn't want uh, British lives lost. Uh, and so they sort of kept out of it. And the Indian leaders, having got their independence in Pakistan, felt they could handle it themselves. And the tragedy is that there were troops here who could have policed uh, the violence uh, and it could have been reduced. And as you say, if there'd be more preparation. Uh, Matt Batten, slight, sleight of hand really, was to only announce the boundaries literally the day after independence. And everyone panicked and there was nothing in place. And the Punjab boundary force, which had been brought in to police things, uh, was really not large enough to do that. And by that stage, even the army and police had been so, uh, had become so sectarian that people, in a sense, were just operating along sectarian lines. So it was one of the huge tragedies that, as you say, probably was unavoidable, but um, I don't think we can blame Mountbatten totally for it. Um, I think he, 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 he did, he was very worried about the fact that the army was being broken up. He suggested that it should just split a third, two thirds, uh, and not on communal lines. And that was um, ignored. And of course, people like Ockenleck were, were absolutely appalled by what was happening. Um, but I think he was just, you know, he had to go ahead with what the politicians said. Um, the young lady in red. Good morning. Um, so um, my question to you is kind of two part. Um, so um, in popular culture, especially when we're talking about India, there is a notion that Mountbatten, the last vice viceroy of India, was, was a very weak character who um, somehow was not able to retain the crown jewel of the British Kingdom. Um, how, in your opinion, now that you've done such a massive and com you know comprehensive research on this, how um, how valid do you think that kind of a claim is? Especially when there are so many pop culture references, television shows, um, seminars where people continuously credit um, Lord Mountbatten as being one of the weakest viceroys India has ever seen. Uh, secondly, I wanted to know um, in uh, in their relationship, in Dicky and Edwina's relationship, at the end of the day, how major a role did Edwina's relationship with Nehru play? in its entirety. Thank you. I think uh, Matt Batten, uh, he, if he was weak, he was weak because he had very few cards to play. Um, and uh, the, the political will wasn't there to retain India. Uh, Attlee had other pressing concerns, of reform in Britain. There was a, a run on currency. Uh, there was uh, um, the Indian civil service had, had been uh, um, run down. Uh, the troops wanted to come home after five years of war. Uh, the intelligence that he relied on, would have relied on, had moved across to India and Pakistan. So um, he, he had to, he, he was a showman. He was brought in to basically manage this, this defeat, in effect, and make it look like it was a monogamous, monogamous victory. Um, Edwina uh, played a very important role, I mean, not least in persuading. Uh, when the Balkan plan was abandoned uh, in, in the spring of 1947. I mean, it was she who listened to Phoebe Menon, who invited Menon to come up to Shimla. Uh, and so she was a very useful conduit between, well, particularly with Nehru, but, but with other Indian leaders as well. So he deployed her um, to pick up intelligence, to persuade. Uh, and of course, she came into her own with, with uh, the, the violence during partition, setting up uh, various humanitarian uh, programs to deal with it. Uh, and that, I think, was her finest hour. Uh, I, I don't think anyone has a, has a harsh word to say about it, Weena, really, um, from the war onwards, apart from that she was quite difficult with poor old Dickie. And we have completely run out of time. Thank you, everyone, for attending this session. There is only so much we can talk about in 45 minutes. So please pick up a copy of Andrew's book because there's a lot more that we couldn't cover right now because of time constraints. I'll be around all day. And so I'm very happy if anyone's got other questions to come and ask me and I'll be in the tent afterwards. <laughs>
stuff, guys. There's a Check. <laughs> On that note, we'd like to thank Andrew Loney and Narayani Basu. We request you to accept our token of appreciation and love. We'd also like to thank Morning Standard for their support.